Good evening, class. This is our sixth take for the intro. Uh, actually, it really is. Um, too many people laughing and so forth, but we do welcome you to this Wednesday night Bible class, this online study that we've been having for the past several weeks during this pandemic. Uh, my name is, is uh, Michael Whittington. I go by Brother Witt. Um, and I've asked the same panel for the last couple of weeks to join us. And the reason for that is because I thought we would do one more uh, one more Wednesday on the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. So because of that, and I thought we would conclude with the same panel that we began with, um, as one of the ministers for the Antioch Church, I have with me two other of my brothers in Christ, two other ministers, Steve Diggs and Andrew Sowards, and one of our nine shepherds, Tim Partlow. So brothers, I welcome you here as well. Um, Class, what we've been doing is the last couple of Wednesdays, we have been kind of working through the Good Samaritan, not a study of, of Luke chapter 10, or for that matter, a study of any other greater passage, but just those verses, verses 25 through 37. And there were some unanswered questions that I had intended to ask. For that reason, I thought it would be a good idea for us just to come back together. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 10, and let's... Um, Let's ask the Lord to be a part of this. Uh, if, if you will, please just join me in this uh, moment of opening prayer. Righteous Father, we do realize that all we do uh, is by your uh, graciousness, your power within us. And so we pray, Lord, that you'll simply intervene and be a part of this Bible study. Be with Steve and Tim and Andrew and myself and everyone who's listening online. May they have your word open and may you teach them in the next 30 or 40 minutes uh, exactly what you would have them to learn. We do pray that for that reason, um, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual sense, that you'll help us disappear, that you'll help the four of us on the panel just disappear, and that you will speak through us and to them. Hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Well, class, um, let me give you about a one or two minute summary of exactly, you know, what Jesus is talking about in Luke chapter 10. You'll recall in verse 25 that the lawyer, that there was a Pharisaical lawyer, um, someone who was trained in the law of Moses, so knew scripture well, knew the, the, the great Shema, knew that the, the greatest commandment was to love God, and the second greatest was to love one's neighbor as they love themselves. And he really wanted to trick Christ, trick Jesus, so he asked a question. He said, teacher, what must I do to uh, have everlasting life? And Jesus asked back, he said, uh, well, how do you read in the law? What does the law say about that? The law of Moses. And the lawyer replied, well, you are to love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus said, you're absolutely right. If you'll do this, you'll live. Of course, we all know, including our Lord Christ, that no one could, could keep the law perfectly. And so, therefore, that would be the need for the good news, the gospel, and God's mercy and grace through Jesus. But it was the correct answer. If we could keep the law, if we could do, if we could love God and love our neighbor, then indeed we would have life. Now the lawyer understood those two commandments and wanting to justify himself, he simply asked the question, well, tell me who my neighbor is. Who is my neighbor? And so Jesus took this opportunity to share a story. It's a wonderful parable. He said, well, let me tell you a story. And by the way, a parable is an earthly story with this heavenly meaning. So the audience that Jesus is addressing, whoever the audience was, always understood the details. That's the whole point. The lawyer understood the details to the story. What he didn't really understand was the spiritual point, that one moral of the story that Jesus wanted to communicate. So our Lord said, let me tell you a story. There was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and, the, and this lawyer knew that route very well. And he fell among thieves, this man in the story that Jesus is sharing. 
Now, he fell among thieves. He was beaten up and robbed and left by the side of the road to die. It just so happened that a priest walked by, and Jerusalem and Jericho both were filled with priests. And this priest walked by, who really should have understood, love God and love your neighbor, but he passed by on the other side, didn't do a thing to help the man. And then an assistant priest, if you will, a Levite walked by, didn't do anything at all, didn't show any love for God or love for neighbor. And then our Lord continued and said, and then a Samaritan walked by. And the lawyer knew who the Samaritans were, and he knew that the Jews and the Samaritans somewhat hated each other. And there was this, this enormous bigotry and, and prejudice between uh, the Samaritans and your full-blooded Jew, like the Jews in Judea and Galilee. And the Samaritan stopped, and he actually helped the man. He uh, bound up his wounds. He put the man on his own beast, probably a donkey. He uh, took him to the nearest inn, possibly all the way to, to, to uh, Jericho. And he told the innkeeper, take care of the person, gave the innkeeper some money and said, whatever you need uh, on my return trip, I'll be happy to pay you back. He was, he was really helping the poor man who fell among these, these thieves and robbers. And then this is how Jesus concluded the story. He asked the lawyer, which one of the three proved neighbor to the man who fell among thieves. And the lawyer, who couldn't even say the word Samaritan, he said, well, I guess the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. And that's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we've asked several questions about this in the previous two Wednesdays. And so tonight I've got another three or four that I'd love to ask this panel to kind of get their ideas. I respect all of their opinions. Uh, they walk with the Lord. They know scripture. And I think this will prove it to a very interesting discussion. So um, let me just, in fact, uh, let me just call a name and we'll just start with somebody. So I think I'll just start with my brother Steve here. Um, if, if the priest and the Levite, now the priest and the Levite, Steve, were, 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 were religious people, just like you, you're, you're, you are a minister of the gospel of Christ, so am I, uh, so is Andrew, and of course our shepherd uh, Tim there as well. Um, what, what if the priest or the Levite, uh, what if they were going to some kind of religious function? Do you think that would excuse them from, from helping the the man, the, the Samaritan, who fell among thieves. We and don't think I postulated the idea that possibly that was the case in the sense that these guys were coming back from Jerusalem, probably having gone through the ritual uh, cleansing and ceremonial things that went on there, coming back to their homeland, to their to the cities where they worked, and knowing that if they touched this man on the road, that uh, not knowing whether he was alive or dead, and if you were dead, they'd have to go back and, you know, go back through that ceremonial cleaning, could not get on with their priestly work. Now, I don't think that you bought into that with necessarily thinking that, you know, it was probably obvious the guy wasn't dead. But, you know, Jesus doesn't seem to make allowance for, for them not caring for these people. You know, it seems to me that Jesus's point in all of this was that, you know, you have an opportunity in front of you uh, right here, right now, you know, the, the, you know, man's idea is that God helps those who help themselves. Jesus seems to have more the idea that God helps those who help others. And to me, that's the focus of what Christ seems to be trying to communicate here. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, you know, actually, I, um, and if I kind of flippantly kind of said I didn't agree with you that you know and that's okay even if I do or don't you know just like we, but but in fact I really do um, I, I think the whole point let, let, let me share one quick illustration and then I'm going to turn it over to Tim and Andrew and actually on my notes this is the only illustration I have guys so I promise you there won't be that preacher in me come out I will not dominate um, whenever Debbie and I first married 40 whatever 47 years ago in August a Harlan Overton was the minister who married us in Corpus Christi, Texas. And I shared this story 14 years ago with the church at Antioch. So you were all there then, so you might remember this. Um, in fact, I would be really impressed, I guess, if you did. But anyway, Harlan um, 
when I was a teenager uh, attending the same church that Debbie attended, um, we were waiting for Harlan to preach. We're all there in the auditorium, maybe three or 400 people there gathered together in the auditorium. And, and Brother Overton, that the, that the teens just loved. They just, he was always our favorite, which is why we asked him to marry us. Um, he, was a, he, was a, he was a missionary to, uh, to Mexico, spoke fluent Spanish, and had the guitar and would sing. And just, you know, at, at our youth gatherings, he was great. Anyway, he, he, he did not show up. He wasn't even there. And so one of the elders got up and we sang a few songs and led a prayer. Anyway, the service ended abruptly. It was kind of over quickly. I saw Harlan kind of straggling in um, about an hour later. And I was really upset with him because I really wanted to hear him preach. So I asked him, I said, where were you, Brother Overton? And then he shared the story that going down South Staples, which was a street on the way to the church building, he was behind this pickup. Uh, driven by a uh, farmer, probably from the Valley of Texas, uh, and filled with citrus, this older gentleman driving the pickup. Apparently, the tailgate came down, and all of the grapefruit came out of the tail, you know, came off the, the truck, and were, it was just all over the highway. In fact, Harlan said he had to swerve around the fruit in order to, uh, to miss it, and then the guy was in his rear view mirror, and he quickly said, to himself, he said, "Somebody ought to help that man." And then, of course, it really he, he just it dawned on him what he was saying. So the Spirit of God nudged him, even though he was going to preach, nudged him to turn his car around. And for the next thirty minutes, he helped this man pick up grapefruit, which was his his living. It was the the only money that he would probably have, you know, for for some time. And he, and they and they put as much of the fruit back in the truck. And as he was sharing this to this 16-year-old boy, I thought, man, that's the best sermon I've ever heard. Um, anyway, that's my thought. And so as I asked the question to all four of us who are religious leaders, and I know, I know that the three of you would have stopped and helped the man as well. That's my thought. Um, any other thoughts? What, what do you think, uh, Tim or Andrew, about someone offering the excuse, well, I was on my way to visit the sick or on my way to, uh, and then we bypass an opportunity like this. I would, um, <clears throat> I would say in, in definitely my years of youth ministry, um, I tend to be um, kind of a task oriented type person. Um, I, I typically have a list or I get in mind, this is what I need to do. And unfortunately, I think there have been times I've passed by uh, teenagers or parents that needed to have a discussion or had a need. It may, it may, the need may not have been as obvious as, you know, somebody beat them up on the side of the road or um, it, it was just maybe they didn't have a discussion because they were struggling with uh, whatever issue it might be, depression or, or whatever. And um I was so focused on getting my lesson set up, getting my PowerPoint set up, getting the next activity rolling at a retreat or a camp. Um, I think more times than not, I have to admit, I, I push through to the task um, over the person. And, and I, I can't help but wonder if this um, expert in the law, if he was, I mean, someone who's an expert in the law is probably kind of a type A uh, very task oriented um, type person. And so for them, you know, I can see them looking at the story and, and somewhat Jesus just has a way of throwing things in people's face to try to wake them up uh, a little bit. And, and I think maybe that might be happening here um, on this occasion. That's how this story's always hit me. It's always hit me that I'm, I've got to set aside my task more often because no doubt the spirit nudges and the spirit says, man, you really need to sit down and talk to this kid or sit down and talk to this mom. Um, but the task is out there. And I tell myself, well, I'll, I'll come back and do that later. And then more times than not, maybe that doesn't happen. And so um, I think this is just a, a good reminder that, that should drive people like me to action um, in situations like this. That's a great point. Good point. You know, the, um... That we, we talk about, you know, should the Levite, should the priest have stopped if they were ceremonially clean, they're risking being unclean. And, and one of the things I think um, is, is there's certainly ways to determine if the body is, is dead before you touch it. 
uh, my, my wife's two sisters, one of them worked for a sheriff's department, the other worked for a police department. And they tell the story about one of them coming across a dead body on the beach and they call it in. And the question was, how do you know it's dead? And they said, well, we threw pine cones at it. And so we call that the pine cone test. And so they could have picked up a couple of pine cones and thrown it at the body, determined, you know, and if it's dead, maybe there's justification for moving on. But if he's alive, then there's a call to, to hell. Um, you know, I, I think this is a, this is a tough, tough question sometimes. Um, you know, I drive to church and I pass five or six homeless people every time I go to church. And so what's my responsibility there? Um, I've, I've read stories about ministers who were so into serving that they would take calls any time of the day or night. They would, you know, and what they ended up doing was disrupting their family life and doing damage to their family. And one of the things that, that I remember reading in two or three different books I've read is that it, not every emergency has to be dealt with right then. If somebody's marriage has been going bad for 10 years, why do we have to stop right now to fix everything? Can there be a short conversation? Can there be a scheduled time to, to work and assist? And can you still tend to your family, not neglect your family? And so... I think there's a lot of questions that get wrapped into this and, and, and I struggle sometimes with knowing um, when do you drop everything and, and, and when do you keep the appointment with people that you've committed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are, those are all good points. Um, and, and I don't know a single person um, with a conscience who doesn't struggle with what to do with our homeless. Um, Every time I pass, I, I say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I mean, I, I, I'm asking genuinely. I had a good friend of mine in San Antonio, Texas, who was, um, who was uh, one of the uh, uh, leaders of, of he, he had, with his own money, had built a homeless shelter where he brought people in and so forth. And I don't want to, and I probably shouldn't say this online, you know, other than even in the class, uh, just because I don't want to, you know, I, I can't field question, questions. But I asked him, I said, you know, because I, I, I do give a few dollars and so forth. And I know I've got dear brothers who, who have some very innovative ways to help them. Uh, but he said he never gave money. I mean, this is the leader of the homeless gathering in San Antonio, Texas, a city of, of about 1.5 million people. And he said he does other things for them, but he will never give money. Um, I'm not saying that for us not to do that, those listening. I'm just saying that it's a struggle that, that we all have. Um, I'd like to kind of broaden it right now because this particular person, um, the, 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 um, the person in the parable, the Samaritan, um, was uh, beaten up and, and, and robbed and, and, and left for dead. Um, but let's broaden that to kind of include anyone who needs help. Uh, whether it be a phone call, whether it be anybody, whether it be uh, whether it be their next meal, or whether it be just some company, some FaceTime, or, or um, I mean, it's, of course, during the pandemic, FaceTime, but I mean, any other time, just fellowship. Um, we just have some some new neighbors who have just moved in next door. So Debbie made some brownies, and we've and we're going to take it over there and say welcome to the neighborhood and so forth. So let's let's broaden it and and let me ask you a question because we're still uh, sequestered. That's why we're doing this online study. Uh, under this present pandemic, uh, with the Samaritan uh, being identified as someone who just needs help if, of of any kind. Um, do you have any recommendations or anything that you that you could talk about that would uh, help us uh, during this crisis? How can we be How can we be the good Samaritan in this crisis? I think one of the challenges that that we have is that we're not around people and seeing people to know if there are needs, and, and so we almost have to go out and find those. Uh, that that's one of the the difficulties I'm finding. You know, I feel like God has put some people on my heart that I need to reach out to or to talk to. And, and so 
that even takes it another, I have another layer of justification now because it's not that I'm, I'm not even seeing them, but God's put it on my heart, but they won't know if God put that on my heart or not. And so now I have two layers of justification not to contact people or to reach out to people. And so um, for me, it's, you know, I make a list. That's, that's just what I do. I'm, I make a list. So I have a list of four or five people that I wanted to contact this week that I felt like God's kind of put on my heart. And, um, you know, whether I decide to follow through with that, you know, that that's up to me uh, to be able to do that. And so. Well, what, what, what do you do? I mean, what determines who goes on your list? What, what happens? I mean, how do you write the list? Um, I, I think for me, it's just a, a process. I feel like God will just put somebody on my heart. Um, yesterday or day before yesterday, I think it was yesterday, I went over to the Owensby's house and, uh, for Hannah Owensby's birthday. We did the drive-by and went and said hello. And Well, one of, one of their neighbors is someone who attends our church and someone that had, hadn't really crossed my mind until I drove by and noticed their car and thought, wow, I haven't seen them in a while. And, and so for me, that was, well, I'm, I'm putting this family on my list and I need to reach out to them. Um, it may be an email. It may be the prayer request that we get coming in, which is, I, I guess, a little more direct. But um, just having a time to listen to the spirit and, and to try to follow those nudgings, uh, I think, is important. You know, on that very point, I put down three notes a little earlier today, things that I'm kind of learning from this this parable, at least picking up for myself, and it runs right into what you're talking about there, Andrew. Number one, uh, I think that we're being called to keep our periscopes up as Christians, you know, to always be looking for opportunities. And number two, when we see those, to get involved. And number three, when we get involved, to do so with great generosity. Um, you know, we're, you know, in business circles, they always talk about reciprocity agreements. That is, if one business does something for another business, there's a reciprocity agreement essentially saying that that other business then will return the favor. But in our sphere, in our economy as Christians, we don't, we don't need to think that way. Um, I, I want to show you something. This is a book that I wrote several years ago called Be Salty, uh, 278 Simple Things You Can Do to Share Jesus. And it's just a, you know, it's a real simple book, just big print and things. And this isn't a vulgar attempt on my part to sell books. What I was going to say is, if anybody would like to have this, because some of these are very applicable. These are things we could be doing right here and right now. They're kind of like thought sparklers. But if you'd like a copy of this, all you need to do, just send me an email. I'm at Steve, uh, Steve, just make it Steve uh, F. Diggs at gmail.com. Steve F. like Franklin Diggs at gmail.com. And I'll just shoot you the PDF of the thing as a gift. I mean, there's, I, I don't want any money, but it might give us some thought sparkers, you know, some things we could think about doing for folks during this period. Such as, Steve, what? Oh, well, okay. Um, let me just flip it. Number 38, uh, buy something for someone who needs the sale and then give that purchase to someone else. You know, right now, for instance, why not go to the drive up window at, at one of these restaurants that desperate, a local restaurant that desperately needs some income? And, and buy a gift certificate and then give that to someone that we know needs it. That's a great thought. That's a great thought. So if I were to just email you, you'd send me the PDF as well. Yep. Not you, Whit. You'll have to pay for it. Everybody. <laughs> no, it's, it's, yeah, I'll be happy to send it. You're Steve F. Diggs at people.com. I'll email Steve and get a gift certificate from him. And then I'll purchase the book and send it to you with. Perfect. That's it. That's it. That's it. Listen, guys, if you had to call someone, now I, I mean, I see the connection here, but you may not. And, 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 our, and those in the Bible class right now may not. So just bear with me for the moment. But, but if you had to call someone at two or three o'clock in the morning because of some personal problem, something that was really bothering you to the point of waking up an accountability partner or, or just waking up a soul friend other than your own family, other than your, your, your wife or, 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 or child. Um, not asking for names, of course, but I'm asking why, um, why, why would you do that? And, and what traits does a person like that have that, that attracts you um, to, to feel free to call them at, at three o'clock in the morning? 
it, can I tell you a story about that? With this is my Good Samaritan story. Um, I was going to college. I lived in Portland, Oregon, and the first time I went to David Lipscomb in Nashville, I, I rode the bus because my dad worked for Greyhound. I had free bus tickets. Get into Sacramento about midnight. I go off the bus, go up to use the restroom, get held up at knife point. They take all the money out of my wallet. They do let me keep my wallet. They take all my change. And so I'll go downstairs, see the security guard. He runs upstairs, sees that nobody's in the bathroom anymore. He goes out the door, looks up and down the street, and he goes back to his post and stands at his post. <laughs> this is before cell phones. This is before I walk back up to him and I said, I'm going to need to make a phone call. And he said, the pay phones are over there. May I borrow a quarter? <laughs> and so he gave me a quarter. And I went and I called my mom. And I said, uh, hey, so mom, I got held up. I said, I'm okay. I said, um, I need you to call Edwin Shackman and get Randy's number. And Randy was a youth minister in the Los Angeles area. And I said, um, call him and tell him I need him to bring me some money so that I can finish my trip. And so um, I went back, I gave the security guard his quarterback because it was a collect call. And the interesting thing was, um, I don't normally sleep all that well on a bus. I slept so peacefully that night. And we got into LA about noon and, and I got off the bus, not hoping to see Randy, but knowing that he was gonna be there. And I look out and there he is. And he goes and he buys me lunch. And then he's, how much money do you need? And I said, $40, he goes, are you sure? I said, yeah, 40 is plenty to get me a couple days to, to Nashville. I'll be fine. So he gave me $40 and, uh, and I got to Nashville fine on that trip. But um, that was a family that we had grown up with in church and in school. Um, his mom had been a Sunday school teacher. She'd been a teacher, um, fifth grade, sixth grade teacher at, at school. Um, they had lost, Randy and uh, Rodney was my age, Rand, they had lost their father when um, in a car accident, uh, you know, about uh, 16 years earlier, my dad had stepped in and, and kind of been a father figure at times, helped them put up a basketball goal, do those kind of things. And so they were, you know, they were part of our family. They were part of, and so there was, there was no hesitation on my part to do that call. And there was complete, I didn't know what his schedule was. But I just knew he was going to be there, and I was at peace, and um, and then was very blessed that uh, you know he bought me lunch, he gave me money, and and I went on my way. That's touching. You've already somewhat. Steve, go ahead. I see that. Well, that's touching. That's a. Yeah, it is. It is touching. It is touching. You know, Tim, you'd already talked about a little bit about why you could call Randy for any purpose. But kind of, if, if you don't mind, just spend another minute or two on it and explain what, it, what was there or is there about Randy um, that you knew there would be absolutely no problem, that no matter what he was doing, he would be there to help. And then um, if, you, if you can, well, I, I guess these are two different questions. And then, and then really um, relate that to the Good Samaritan. Well, I think, you know, I think part of what I alluded to there, uh, you know, in, in Oregon, grew up in a, in a church of about three to 400 people, so kind of smaller compared to Middle Tennessee standards. But, but in there, you know, there were, there were a handful of families that were just close. You could just show up and knock at the door. Um, you know, you're going to meet the kids on the playground. You're going to, you just, you just did life together. And so it was community. And, and it's, it's where those, those friends start being a little closer than friends. And so, you know, moms and dads would, their moms and dads would discipline you just like your parents would. Uh, but they'd also sit you down at the table and feed you. Um, they'd put their arm around you and give you advice. I mean, it's just, just, that, just that closeness. So Randy was a few years older, um, but he had coached me uh, in, in basketball teams a couple of years. And, uh, and I'd grown up with his, with his brother. And, and, uh, and, and just in the character of his mom and the character of Randy and the character of Rodney, you just, they, they were just people that, that you knew you could call. And, um, and, and, you know, I can list other people like that. Some that are at Antioch with me now, some people that I grew up with where, 
you know, if you didn't call, their feelings would be hurt. Um, be, because they, they expect that. And, and I think by the same token, they would, they would call me. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I think that's, that's relationship and family and community. Now, you know, the good Samaritan, the guy coming along, uh, the Samaritan is, um, you know, he's not family with the person. And, and so he, he just has a heart that is full of mercy. And, um, and, and so he sees the need and he says, okay, I'm this guy's family. I'm the one who's got to take care of him. And he just steps in and does it. And so that, you know, I, I, like Steve said, it's a touching story that I could depend that much on Randy. Um, but here, this guy did, did even more and didn't even know who he was helping. And I think that's one of the amazing things about this story. Yeah. That's the part that, that jumps out to me. Um, a few years back, I guess it's, it's almost been 15 years ago now that uh, my dad passed away and, and I'll never forget. And it, it was not a large thing, but I had a neighbor who lived across the street, um, just kind of across and diagonally from me. And he and I would see each other from time to time. And I think we'd introduced ourselves once, but really we're not uh, people who would spend time talking in the court or driveway or anything like that. But um, he had heard about my dad passing and I was out mowing my yard. I think it was a couple of days after um, we had had a service and, uh, and my mower ran out of gas and I, I started to get in my garage and get my gas can and I was getting ready to go to my truck. And I think he recognized that and he walked across the street, had his gas can in his hand and helped me put, help me put gas in my lawnmower. I mean, he, he really didn't know me. I mean, he knew that my dad had died. Um, he knew that I was a minister. Um, I think I had played basketball with his uh, kind of teenage preteen kids in the, in the court one time in the 10 years I had lived there. Uh, but, but he felt this need just to come over and to uh, uh, just to serve me. Um, and, and that, that to me, that, that's, that's, like what we hear in this story. It's that I don't know this person, but yet I'm going to go over and I'm going to help them. You know, I think that may be a big part of what, of what uh, Jesus is trying to do here is kind of expand our mind a little bit. You said this earlier, Andrew, but Jesus had a way of sort of, you know, uh, kind of <laughs> kicking the holy cow in the udder occasionally, you know, when uh, to, to kind of get people's attention. You know, I mean, Jesus equated hatred with murder and lust with adultery and in this case he he on the positive side equates a neighbor with essentially anyone that god puts in our way to serve uh, bonnie's been reading a book to me uh, I, I wish i could say i've been reading it but she's actually been reading it to me but it's john mark hicks's newest book it's called searching for the pattern i don't know if you've read that with or not but it's it's really a good book and it deals with a lot of the issues within our own fellowship good and bad but there are people within the more conservative side of our fellowship who have a theological bent uh, and where they really believe that the only people that they are supposed to help or support with the church's budget, for instance, is are other Christians rather than just anybody who needs it. And, and to me, this is where Jesus really kicks a yes. big hole inside of that. You know, uh, I, I had something here from Francis Schaeffer that I wanted to read. This is just a short comment that he made on this thing, but, uh, he said something that touches me. He says, Christians are not to love their believing brothers to the exclusion of their non-believing fellow men. This is ugly. We are to have the example of the Good Samaritan consciously in our mind all at all times. And to me, that's kind of what the story here is about in great degree. It's just realizing, you know, anybody out there that's, that's you know, that's got a pulse that needs help is an individual that we can bring a little bit of Jesus to. Yeah, I think, I think you pretty much, um, I mean, I agree with that, Steve. Steve, the other day, uh, just very quickly, uh, you and I were talking privately, of course, and, and you had mentioned someone, a dear friend of yours, that you could call at two or three o'clock in the morning, or that he could call you at two or three o'clock in the morning. And I found that um, um, touching to me. Now, there are those that I could do that with as well, but it, man, I, I, I could count on less than one hand 
a number of people yeah. uh, outside of my family um, that I would feel comfortable, even though I've got the body of Christ and brothers and sisters, and I know they wouldn't mind helping. It's not a matter of whether or not someone would help. It's a matter of having such trust in someone that even if I wanted to share something personal, that I knew that if I called them and talked with them, that it wouldn't go any further. I do think connection with the Good Samaritan and, and that kind of, of, of trustworthiness that we all should have. You know, the Good Samaritan, love God and love your neighbor. Those were the core. Uh, that, that's the foundation upon which this whole parable is, is, is uh, built. Uh, it started with a question from the lawyer. Jesus shared the story. And the story that he shared was, this is how you love God and neighbor. Um, anyway, do you want to share just a few thoughts very quickly, Steve, on, on, on the sort of the same thing that I asked Brother Tim, on the type of, on the traits of a person that you could call your buddy at three o'clock in the morning and know that it, no matter what you said, that it would go no further than that? Well, I don't know what I can add beyond what you just said. I mean, it's a person that, that you know you can lean into and uh, you don't have to explain yourself to and who you know has your best, your best interest at heart. And like you said, there are not too many people like that. I mean, I mean, you mentioned that you don't have a lot of wit. And I mean, you can, you can always call me up till about seven in the evening. After that, I'm not available, but... Um, <laughs> No, certainly. I mean, I think we, I think we all four here know that we're close enough that we can do that. I hope we do. Yeah. But there are not very many people out there like this. Um, a lot of pretty good thinkers over the years have said that if you have more than three or four true friends when you die, you're probably being too loose with your definition of friendship. And it's also sort of, I mean, the onus also falls on me, falls on us. Um, there are a lot of people that are trustworthy but I don't know if I want them to see all the, all the yeah. uh, dings, you know, all the, you know, in, in my armor, all the dinks in my armor kind of, you know, so uh, that, that, that's part of it. Well, listen, let's, let, let me close with, um, with something that I heard years and years ago, because I think it kind of closes, it fits into what we've all been talking about. Um, and I don't think I shared this the last couple of weeks. I may, I may have, I'm not even sure. Sort of nod your head if you think if you heard it. But I heard a story from Mother Teresa about Mother Teresa in Calcutta. And she was working with apparently a novice nun, young lady. And the, the young nun was supposed to be plucking maggots out of the wound of a leper. But she was doing this odious task at, at arm's length you know, like I would be doing it, as far back as she could get to pluck the maggots out of this wound of the leper. And the story goes that Mother Teresa came behind her and, and pushed her, her face uh, into the, the leg of this, you know, close to the leg of this leper. I mean, she was just inches away and plucking the maggots out. And Mother Teresa said, you don't understand, my dear. This is the leg of Christ, our Lord. And it just, when I read about it, 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 it moved me and I've never forgotten it. And to me, it, it parallels with the Good Samaritan, that we don't have to know someone to, to want to help because we know the Lord. Um, I was hungry, you gave me food, thirsty, you gave me drink, that kind of a Matthew 25 moment. So in closing, um, it, we just need to be reminded, I think, um, how, how we can be the Good Samaritan, how the Lord is calling us. This parable was not written for Steve or Tim or Andrew. It was written for me. And in fact, all of Scripture is, is, is for me. And if I don't apply it, then it's meaningless. So it's, it's mirror time for me. And I know it would be the same for them as well, but it's mirror time for all of us. We need to look in the mirror, look in God's mirror, and put ourselves on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho and ask ourselves, would we stop 
And if the answer is no, then let the Lord work with us. If the answer is yes, then ask God to continue to, uh, to show us how to love uh, each other and therefore love him. Are there any closing thoughts, guys, on anything that you want to add? There's to one thing with that I just was uh, thinking about something I read as we were preparing for this discussion. And, um, and, and that is, you know, we, we talk about wanting to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's our, that's our goal. And I think when you look at this story, the good Samaritan is a symbol of Jesus. And so you look at what the man lost. Um, you know, he, he lost his health. And so the good Samaritan puts oil and wine to, to restore those injuries. Um, he lost his ability to travel. He couldn't walk anymore. And so he picked them up, put him on his donkey and carried him forward. He lost his money. And so he gave money to the, the hotel keeper to take care of him and promise to meet any other needs that came through. And so, you know, Jesus wants to restore us. Jesus wants to make us complete. He wants us to, to have a joy and to have that, that fully. And, and so the Good Samaritan is a representation of Jesus doing that. And so when we pray, let me be your hands and feet, we're praying, let me be the Good Samaritan so I can do the things that Jesus would do. Wow, that's a great close. Um, Andrew, why don't you lead us in a closing prayer? I don't think we need to add anything beyond what Tim just said. Okay. All right. Let's bow. Father, we come to you and you have been so gracious to us, Father. We are, um, we are the, the individual on the side of the road that needs help. And Father, you um, sent your son to show us how to do that. And uh, not only through this story, but in the way that he lived his life, the way that he loved people. Uh, the way that uh, he met people where they were and helped lead them to where they need to be. And Father, I pray that as we go through this, uh, through this life that you've given us, this precious life, God, that you would help us to see those physical needs that are around us, uh, similar to this. But Father, as we, as we try to minister to people physically, help us not to forget the spiritual side of things and help us to draw uh, people into relationship with you. Uh, Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the gift of eternity. Uh, that, that is so much better than, than anything we could ever want or desire. And through so Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Yep. Thanks, Whit. Yeah. Thanks, God.